Hey everybody, it's Dr. Tim and Hillary, our social media coordinator. And today in this podcast, we're going to open up the email box, um, Facebook and all the other social media and answer questions that we get all the time. How you doing, Hillary? I am doing good. I think this is going to, I think this is the first one of these that we've done, but maybe we can uh, make it a regular thing because we do get a lot of questions and a lot of them are very similar. So hopefully we'll be able to answer people's questions and get some more good knowledge out there. Yep. All right. Looking forward to it. Yeah. We can make this a regular monthly or uh, however often, sometimes the mailbox fills up with something that happens and people have lots of questions. Yeah. So let's get started. All right. So number one question, and this is a multi-part question, if you will. We get a lot of people asking, saying that they're doing our fishless cycle um, with one and only, and during their cycling, when do they do a water change? When the ammonia readings are above what level? When the nitrite readings are above what level? When the nitrate readings and the pH are above what levels should they do a water change? Okay, well, first off, there's no real wrong time to do a water change during the cycling. The only rule is don't disturb the substrate because that's where the bacteria are and they haven't generated enough of their stickiness, this substance called EPS, to stick to the substrate. So if you start cleaning the substrate, you're probably going to be removing your bacteria. But um, that, that said, if your ammonia is above five, then we recommend a partial water change because the bacteria will work faster when the ammonia is lower. And the same's kind of with nitrite. If it's above five, it's going to slow the bacteria. So you can do a water change. You just take water off the top of the column and uh, remove it, replace it. Try not to, like I say, disturb the substrate when putting the water back into the aquarium either. For nitrate, now I, I'm not a big believer in measuring nitrate a lot during cycling because as I've said before in some of our talks, if you have nitrite above two or three, it's going to interfere with your nitrate test and you're going to get a, a wrong reading. You know, some people record, I've just started cycling and my nitrate is 160. That's pretty much impossible. So, uh, but again, it, it, you know, if it makes you feel comfortable, go ahead and change the water when the nitrate is reading above 30 or 40, change some of the water. Now, pH is important because pH is an indicator of your buffering capacity and water that has low buffering capacity and low pH is going to slow the cycling. So if your pH has dropped and is near seven or below seven, it is definitely time to do a water change. 7.5, you can do it then. Above 7.5, there's really no reason to do a water change when it comes to pH. Okay, so those are some very specific things. And, you know, I, I know when, especially if you're new to this and you've never done a cycle before, or if you have done a fish in cycle, or, you know, you're maybe not testing your levels when you first go to start testing these things, you're like, oh my gosh, that reading is really, really red or really green or whatever the colors are for your test kits. So this hopefully should give you guys that are listening an idea as to when to do a water change if you want to do one. Yeah, and I, and I should have qualified that. I'm talking about when you're doing a fishless cycling. If you're cycling with fish in the tank and your ammonia and nitrite are high, say above two or three with fish in the tank, then you should do a water change. And I, I'll be upfront. I don't recommend adding chemicals at this point in terms of um, an ammonia remover because that's just going to mask the problem. So it's much better use a simple dechlor and just change water when you've got fish in the tank and there's high levels above uh, two or three ammonia or nitrite. Yep. 
too soon. All right, moving on to question number two. So this is another one that we get uh, not as often, but people will tell us that they have a saltwater tank or a freshwater tank and they accidentally purchased the freshwater or the saltwater, the one that they don't have, the one and only. Can they still use that on their system? Okay, there's actually scientific research that answers this question. I, I showed it years ago in one of my first papers, but since then there's been many other uh, peer-reviewed research papers and it shows that the saltwater um, nitrifying bacteria are different than the freshwater nitrifying bacteria. The saltwater nitrifying bacteria or organisms have a wider salinity tolerance. So you can use our salt water one and only in fresh water and you're not gonna have any issues. It's probably gonna cycle just as fast. Vice versa though, not so good. I mean, adding our fresh water nitrifiers to a salt water system is better than not doing anything but you can expect that the cycle is not going to go so fast. The freshwater guys pretty much poop out at around 10 to 13 parts per thousand. So about a third strength seawater. And that brings up, if you're doing a brackish water aquarium, you should choose the marine or the saltwater version. But to answer the question, saltwater is perfectly fine and fresh. Fresh water is okay but not great in salt water. Okay, good to know. I learned something new on that one. I, every time we have these podcasts, I always learn something new as we go. <laughs> great. All right, next up, and this is definitely applicable to the times that we've got going on right now, because I know a lot of people are seeing this really cold winter weather. And if you visit our website, you probably have seen the little disclaimer that will pop up across the top, um, encouraging you to add those heat packs to your orders. What is the purpose of adding the heat packs to the order for winter packaging? Well, the purpose of the heat pack is to keep the bacteria from freezing. It's, it's not wheat to keep the bacteria warm. We grow these bacteria at about 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we ship them, especially right now where places are getting lots of uh, snowfall, we don't want them to freeze. Freezing solid will kill the nitrifying organisms. So the purpose of the heat pack is to really keep the bacteria from freezing. It's not to keep it at 85 degrees. We'd have to have a huge pack and lots of heat, and it would be economically uh, terrible for, for the consumer to pay to try to keep it at 85 degrees. So it's just to keep it from freezing. The bacteria will arrive they, they're not going to be warm. They may even be cold to the touch, the bottle, but that's okay. As long as they're not frozen solid, they're still, still viable. And that's the purpose of the heat pack. All right. That's good to know. So if you get some of these that are cold, but you've ordered the heat packs, don't worry. As long as they're not frozen, they're still going to be okay. Exactly. Okay, we have a lot of questions about one and only this time. So next up is um, when people are using one and only and they're dumping it into their tank, um, are they going to see any sort of particulate or anything floating around in the water column? Uh, they could. We grow one and only on a very small nanoparticle because nitrifiers want to be on a surface. So when we're growing them in our reactors, we provide them with a surface. When they've been in the bottle for a while, they can tend to stick together because this surface is a positively charged surface. It starts to stick together. So you may see some particulate after you uh, shake the bottle and pour into the tank. You might not. It just depends on many conditions uh, if you do, it's just, it's not a problem, but you're not always going to see that. You might see some cloudiness and you might see some particulate either way. Okay. But so will that settle out over a period of time? 
definitely the one and only particulate will settle out over a period of time. If you, st if you see particulate in your tank, you know, even eight hours later or 24 hours later, that's not one and only that that's came from something else because our particulate will settle even in a tank with a decent current, it's going to find some place it will settle. All right. Good to know. Okay. Next up, another one and only question. <laughs> Sounds silly saying one and only question, multiple one and only questions. Um, so if somebody is starting up a new tank and they are using live rock, now when I say live rock, I mean the stuff that comes a lot of times it'll be packaged in um, damp newspaper or wet newspaper. There will be um, a lot of moisture in the packaging. Is it okay to use one and only with that live rock? Oh, definitely. It's it. And we, we want you to do that because no matter the quality of the live rock and the dampness during the shipping process, some of that organic material is going to die. And then, you know, you should rinse the live rock in a bucket or something before you put it in your tank. But still, that dead organic material is going to decay into ammonia. And you want the one and only bacteria in there to take care of that uh, ammonia coming from the live rock. And this leads uh, to another point that if you're using this fresh, wet live rock or and or live sand, we recommend you set the tank up first, get everything running and add the bacteria. But before you add the ammonium chloride, assuming you're doing a fishless cycling, measure the ammonia in the water because the live sand has organics that decay into ammonia and the wet live rock may have organics that will decay into ammonia. So your water may already have ammonia in it and you won't have to add the ammonia drops right away or maybe you only add one drop per gallon or instead of the normal four because you don't want the ammonia to go too high. Okay, good to know. All right, next question. If, and this goes for fish in cycling, most of these other questions we've talked about so far are fishless cycling. So if somebody is doing fish in cycling, they're only adding one fish to the tank, say something like a betta, um, is it okay to add the fish right after putting the one and only in? Yes, one and only is completely non-toxic. It's going to settle out. There's nothing in there that can harm the fish. So you can add the one and only at any time. If, if you've decided, you know, I set this tank up, added my fish. I didn't want right away to add bacteria, but now my ammonia is high, but I have fish in the tank. What do I need to do? We'd recommend maybe a partial water change, but then add the ammonia right into the tank. Uh, it's completely non-toxic to all fish and invertebrates. No. Now, next up, when it, if you've been following on our Instagram, you've probably seen I've done some posts about a dosing schedule, especially if you're doing using the one and only the fishless cycle. Um, where can they find, aside from going on our Instagram, I've posted it there, but where can they find the original source of that dosing schedule? Well, www dot dr tim's aquatics.com or i don't even think you need the w's anymore just dr tim's aquatics.com and under recipes you'll find it you can print it out um and it'll give you a step-by-step day-by-day uh there's a schedule and there's even you when you print it out there's a day-by-day -day chart you can put your numbers in and you can plot your your progress as you go one thing that people need to recognize recognize about this dosing is that it's a recommendation. When we say dose on day three or dose on day five or six or whatever, you, you only dose if the ammonia and the nitrite are below a certain level. It doesn't mean just blindly dose on those days. Every tank is different. So we can't guarantee 
what your water quality is going to be on any day. We have guidelines and you follow the guidelines, but you need to make your own judgment. You have to have test kits to do a fishless cycling. And if the ammonia or nitrite are high, you skip that dose, just like it says, skip the dose. It's not a problem. The bacteria are not going to starve. We get this all the time. You know, if I don't feed the bacteria daily, they're going to die. No, they're not human. Um, in almost all cases, the ammonia bacteria cycle faster than the nitrite. So the ammonia will disappear and you might have nitrite at two or three and we'll recommend not dosing ammonia until that nitrite drops a little bit more and people will freak out and go, my bacteria are going to starve to death because I'm not feeding them. No, they're not. They can go several days. They can go weeks without ammonia. So don't just blindly dose the ammonia every day and don't blindly just dose because the chart says so. Look at what your water quality is. Okay, now this isn't one of the questions that I had originally written down, but it definitely goes along with what you were talking about. And, you know, it ties in a little bit to that first question, when to do a water change. So you were saying that, excuse me, when you are going to add ammonia, you might not need to add ammonia. So what are the, those levels that we're looking for? If it's at a certain level, you don't need to add ammonia. Well, if, if ammonia or nitrite are above five, definitely, and hear what I said, ammonia or nitrite. If they're above five, do not add more ammonia until both of them drop. And we like them to be at least below two. So you measure an ammonia zero and nitrite is three. Wait another day. And then the ammonia zero, nitrites one, go ahead and dose again. That's, but, but it's a little bit, it, it all depends. If you're only um, setting up a tank, say you mentioned a beta earlier, for one beta, our recommendations are to get a tank uh, biological cycle going that's going to have a lot of fish, you know, 10, 20, at least one or two fish per gallon, which is a rule I hate, but people understand that. Um, if you're going to have one beta, that fish is not going to produce a lot of ammonia. So our dosing schedule can be relaxed. Instead of four drops per gallon, you can do one drop per gallon because you're only going to put in one fish. So this, this guide is a guide. It's not an ironclad rule. You have to kind of use a little bit of common sense of, am I going to have a lot of fish in this tank? Then I want to be adding a lot of ammonia to grow a lot of bacteria. Am I going to have one or two small fish? I don't need to add so much ammonia. And you'll cycle faster, truthfully, if you're not adding as much ammonia. That makes sense. It's all definitely important to take a look at the bio load that's going to be going into your tank. Right. And then some people... Um, you know, they, they use special soils or they've got the pH really low or the water hardness is, is really low. All that's going to affect the time this takes. And um, we've talked about this in the past. We have a guide at drtimsaquatics.com about the top 13 things about cycling. And, and everyone kind of freaks out that it's complicated and, and it's not that it's new is different, but it's not that complicated. Just think about you're adding a food source, the ammonia, and you don't want it to get too high and you have to give them some time to cycle and let the test kits guide you. Yep, excellent advice. Okay, next up, and we touched on this a little bit from one of our other questions, but um, I heard from somebody, they were writing in saying that they had read somewhere that when we they use one and only that it is supposed to cause the tank to be cloudy. Um, how long should they anticipate their tank being cloudy for? Well, first off, your tank may not always be cloudy. And uh, we've got some videos that show, you know, myself pouring it into the, into the tank, but that bacteria is right out of the reactor. 
and it really hadn't had time to settle into the bottle very much. So it's, it's cloudier than if you get a bottle that's on a store shelf that's a month or two old. There's nothing wrong with that bottle. It's just that the material has settled and it's not going to generate the cloud as fresh material will, but it still has all the bacteria and it's still going to work. Now, how long is it going to stay cloudy? Usually, as I mentioned, eight to 12 hours, definitely overnight, it should clear up. In, yeah. So it shouldn't be more than a day. And in fact, it shouldn't be more than maybe six to eight hours. And then the water should be pretty clear. Okay. Next up, and this is again, another one that you've touched on. Um, can I use prime with one and only? Well, can, yes. Should you? <laughs> should you? No. In fact, I'm not sure if you saw this exchange, but this person, well, I think it was Facebook. And they, you know, can I use prime with my fishless cycling? And it's like, Okay, your fishless cycling, you're going to be adding ammonia drops and then you want to add the prime, yes. Okay, but why do you want to add the ammonia drops if you're just going to neutralize the ammonia with the prime right afterwards? And I can almost picture the wheels turning in this person's mind going, that's true. Why do I want to add ammonia and then add a chemical to remove the ammonia? I don't. So you don't really want to use prime or, or really even our aqua cleanse product when you're doing a fishless cycling because it binds up the ammonia and it, it just prolongs the cycle use a simple dechlor and this is a question we get a lot you know, i didn't dechlor my water well you have to get rid of the chlorine and the chloramine that's in the water and almost all water in the united states has chlorine or chloramines in it because that's a disinfectant to keep the bacteria down to make the water healthy for us to drink. So use our first defense, use a simple dechlor to get rid of the chloramine and chlorine and then put in the one and only and don't use prime or aqua cleanse or these anything that says ammonia remover on the label during the cycling period. All right, good to know. Okay, this is another one. And I believe a lot of times you can find this information on the bottles and again, online, but just in case, how much ammonium chloride do people need to dose? So when we first started, and Dr. Tim's is 14, 15 years old, uh, our ammonia was one drop per gallon. And that's what we did videos on. And now we have videos out there that have been seen a couple hundred thousand times. And it still says one drop because if we remove the video, we remove all those looks and we want to be up at the top so that people get the right information when they're on Facebook and YouTube looking at fishless cycling. So we changed the formula to make it easier and it's four drops per gallon. But the reality is there is no wrong amount to dose. You can use one drop, two drop, three drops, maximum four drops. As I said earlier, if you're only going to have a couple of fish in there, if you're trying to cycle for some small fish, if the, if the load isn't very big, one drop per gallon, two drops per gallon is fine. We recommend four because that is a will generate a good biomass of bacteria to let you add fish, a good population of fish, especially if you're setting up a saltwater, your marine tank, and you're quarantining all your, all your fish at one time, you're going to want to add all those fish together. And you can build up a really good biological cycle using four drops per gallon. Okay, good to know. Yeah, just another case of use your best judgment and uh, base it on your individual scenario, what you've got going on in your tank. Right. All right, next up. When I add the ammonia, does the chloride become chlorine? And what do I do? Uh, no, it does not. 
Okay, to generate chlorine takes a lot of energy. So the chloride does not change in to chlorine. You don't have to worry about that. So there's nothing to do about that. Don't worry about it. Okay. And uh, actually, I, now, one point I want to bring up is our ammonia drops are ammonium, ammonium chloride. And that, that has no smell. Another popular type of ammonia is ammonium hydroxide. And that's generally the ammonium that's used in cleaning solutions. If you've got something under the, you know, in the laundry room for cleaning your floor and it's got ammonia in it and it smells like ammonia, that's ammonium hydroxide. And that's because the pH of that is really high. So you can smell the gaseous ammonia. Yes. The ammonium chloride is not going to have a scent. So we actually get people taking the tip off and smelling it and then emailing us going, this is an ammonia or I have a bad batch because I can't smell it. That's not the case. We use ammonium chloride because it's easier to use. And if you overdose, it's not going to drastically affect your pH. If you over, if we were to sell ammonium hydroxide and you overdosed, it would shoot your pH up in the nine, tens, elevens, even higher where people, where fish don't live. So don't worry about if you don't have a smell, believe me, it's ammonium chloride. All right. Again, I learned something new. I didn't realize that it, I mean, I knew it didn't have a smell, but you know, you think about sometimes people use it for cleaning and stuff and it definitely smells. <laughs> yes. All right. And this next question is again, something that we've touched on throughout the previous questions, do I need to dose it every day? I think we've come to the conclusion, no, you don't. Make sure you're doing your testing. Yes, I like to say, you know, fishless cycling without test kits is like driving at night with the headlights off. You're going somewhere, but you may not like what happens before you get there <laughs> or where you end up. So you don't have to dose every day. You don't have to dose twice a day. Um, and the other thing I like to bring up, because we say four drops per gallon will get you to two, and people think, well, I've got to get to two, and they keep on adding ammonia. No, don't do that. Maximum four drops per gallon, no more. These test kits, you're, you're, you may not measure two right away. If you've put in a lot of bacteria, the bacteria start working right away. So, so just stick with the four drops max. Don't worry about trying to obtain some ammonia level. Okay. All right. Now this next question um, is interesting. Now, if someone were to purchase our products and they wanted to store them in different containers, are there any issues with that? Uh, well, you don't want to store any of our bacteria or really any of our bacteria, ammonia is fine, but most of our products you don't want to store in any clear containers uh, because you've got uh, nutrients in there or vitamins or something like that for the one and only, and you don't want to start growing algae in there, or you've got bacteria and uh, you start adding light, you, you can start getting some reactions. So you don't really want to store in clear containers um, but if you want to store in other containers, that's fine. I don't really know why you'd want to do that, but that's okay. All right. Good to know. Plus, and this is something I thought of when I saw that question is you don't, hopefully the other containers are clean, but you know, they might not be a hundred percent safe. You don't want anything getting in there that might react or interact negatively. Definitely. And, and I wouldn't recommend storing any of our bacteria in a container that used to have any type of chemicals because you just don't know how that's going to react. Yep. All right. Here's another one. Before I start a fishless cycle, am I able to add plants to the tank? I'm, this is a freshwater tank question. Uh, that's actually an, uh, a pretty good question. What I recommend is cycle first and then add the plants. And the reason I say that is because once you start talking about plants, um, there's a whole, a bunch of uh, 
you know, lots of different plants. And if you're doing Anubias, which are, you know, tough plants, it's, the ammonia is not going to harm them. But if you're doing some of the other plants that are really thin leaved or a little bit more uh, uh, delicate, the higher levels of ammonia could harm them. So it's just better to cycle the tank and then start planting. And during the planting, yes, you're going to stir up some stuff. Uh, let, let that settle. You know, that, there's bacteria there and just let that settle. But overall, I'd recommend doing the fishless cycling, then adding the plants. Okay. Now this next question is geared towards saltwater tanks. Is refresh safe to use if you've got uh, snails in the tank? Well, it actually doesn't matter whether it's salt water or fresh water. Refresh, we don't know why, at high doses can harm snails and shrimp. And, and I wish I had an ironclad rule, but I, but I don't. But when we test these products, we do toxicity testing. One of my first jobs right out of college and back from the Peace Corps was in a toxicity lab. And we would do like 10 times the recommended dose and 50 times the recommended dose in bare bottom tanks with no substrate. And, and doing this testing with refresh, we did see some mortality in shrimp and snails. So we put that warning in there because let's face it, folks, how many of you are really measuring out what you put in your tank? I know you're out there. You're not measuring. Okay. You just pour this... <laughs> talking to all of you, but you, you know, nobody <laughs> sitting there with a beaker and a graduated cylinder, putting this in there. They're just dumping it in. I know this. Okay. Uh, and so we put that warning in there, uh, especially, you know, just, just in, in many cases it isn't, but you just have to be careful. That's what I would recommend. Yep. Rather to be safe than sorry. All right, this is our very last question. Um, I've had several people ask because they have seen this stuff online and I think people have these products. We have test kits as well as different kinds of media. Where can those be purchased? Yes, we just started uh, middle of last year with uh, test kits by uh, ASF, Aquarium Systems France. They're really nice test kits. You can buy those at Dr. Tim's Aquatics and we're getting them out into distribution. But right now, Dr. Tim's Aquatics has the test kits along with our media. We have biological media, uh, GFO, aluminum oxide, ion exchange media, all sorts of different uh, activated carbon mixes of all those. And all that type of media is available at Dr. Tim's. And there's a couple of stores. If you're in Southern California, I'll give a shout out to Tongs down in Orange County. It's carrying our products, our media. And uh, it's brand new. So we're just getting it out into distribution. Okay, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I've got some of the test kits and I plan on uh, showing you guys some water testing just so you can see the test kits and I think if you have seen our previous podcast if you've gone on YouTube you can see some of the different vivid colors when we've done some of the tests and talked about them on there yep all right well that is all I've got now before we go I do have a shout out that I want to give I've got to I've got to read double check the name real quick so give me just a second Well, she's checking that out. The main thing when you're doing, like today, a lot of the questions were on one and only and fishless cycling. The best thing to do is just step back. Don't panic. Just, just step back and go, you know what? I can wait till tomorrow. I don't have to add the ammonia. I don't have to do that water change. As long as the tank's not leaking, just relax. You can contact us at info at Dr. Tim's. Check out the videos that we've put up podcast everything's going to be fine you don't have to start over drain the tank the people say this is complicated let's make it uncomplicated and the first thing to make things uncomplicated is to relax 
Yes. And enjoy that. Cause that's really why we're all in this. Right. Just, just, just enjoy. And uh, we'll get you through this. All right. I found my super fan shout out. Romeo Jerry Martinez has been interacting with us on Facebook and has heard all of our podcasts. So thank you so much for listening to all of these. And I gotta say, I'm very impressed that you were able to answer our question on uh, Facebook the other day. So thank you so much for listening. All right. We'll have to send him a t-shirt if you have an address. Yeah. All right. Yes, I believe I do. I, we have swag at Dr. Tim's. Oh yeah. Ha okay. I I've posted some photos of it. The coffee mugs with the little spoons. <laughs> <laughs> they're fantastic yeah and and a question can i put chocolate hot chocolate in those yes folks it's not just a coffee mug you can put yes. tea and anything tea and, hot chocolate you name it you, even a little schnapps if you're of it <laughs> you know I, we, we've been talking about having a contest to hat like allow people to win one of these coffee mugs maybe that's what we should do is who can send us the best recipe for a drink to go in this coffee mug, we'll send you a mug. I think that's a alcoholic drink or drink. <laughs> I, I think it can be any. Maybe we could have two categories. <laughs> Adults and kids. That's it. There we go. All right, folks. So you heard it. Stay tuned. Look out for that giveaway. We'll be posting that in the next week or so. If you have any questions that you'd like to have answered or, you know, you just want to say, hey, feel free to drop us a message on any of our social media platforms. We love hearing from you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. And until next time, this is Dr. Tim and Hillary, and this is Dr. Tim's Aquatics Podcast.